At the boat ramp around the corner from my apartment lies a white behemoth, sitting silent as a tomb. Or to a dock which no longer connects to shore, she bobs up and down in the water, only disturbed by the wake of passing boats. Rust has begun to creep down each of her 100 and 40 foot long sides, almost looking as though some unseen ocean monster has gouged into it with its claws, and no light ever emanates from her many windows and portholes. The cam has, in a way, become part of my town's landscape for the last two decades and change ever since her previous owners failed to pay the mooring fees for it, and it was seized, both by the local government and the US. Marshall's service for separate reasons, there have been rumors of everything from drugs to botched scientific experiments taking place on board during her history. She originally was moored closer to downtown, but a few years ago, she was moved to her new home and has sat there ever since, and it was thanks to those rumors that, one day, while sitting on the couch playing video games with my two friends, Darren and Zeke, the plan was hatched. We'd taken a small break, and Zeke stood up to grab a beer from the fridge. You know, I always wondered what exactly happened with that ship to make something which was once so beautiful and grand. Just, you know, get abandoned and forgotten about. I twisted around on the couch to see him looking out of my kitchen window. I knew exactly what he was referring to. Dude, your guess is as good as mine, man. I answered, now get back here and help us beat these putzes. There was a moment's pause and I heard him walk back over. For the next few hours, there was no mention of the ship as we slogged our way through deathmatch after deathmatch. I honestly thought the whole thing had been dropped. That was until we wrapped up things for the night and my friends got ready to head home. You know what? Darren asked as he slipped on his jacket. For a change of pace, we should have a bit of an adventure. You know, get out of the house instead of wasting ourselves away on the couch. Zeke and I exchanged glances with each other, then shrugged. Well, what you got in mind? I asked him. The second the question left my lips, I knew I shouldn't have taken the bait. As an extremely mischievous smile spread across his face, why don't we sneak on board the cam Friday night? Finally see for ourselves what she looks like on the inside. I felt a pang of surprise shoot through me. Zeke was always the one suggesting wild and slightly dangerous things for us to do, to hear Darren, who usually seemed a bit antsy about breaking the rules volunteer something of this nature to do, frankly shocked me. Dude, you serious? Zeke asked him. He nodded. Seriously, with everyone celebrating Easter with their families, the boat dock will be pretty much empty Sunday night. I'm sick of just doing the same stuff over and over, sick of playing it safe. I say we go a bit buckwild. He cast a hopeful look our way. For a second, my mind remained blank, and then it clicked. Maggie, his girlfriend of three years, had recently broken up with him for another man, and to say he hadn't taken it well would be like calling the Chernobyl melt on a small accident. He'd changed since then, becoming a bit darker, and more willing to bend the rules. He gave us both a hopeful look. What about it? Zeke immediately laughed. Dude, hell yes, you're speaking my language now. I became aware that both of them were now looking at me. What do you say, Adrian? Darren asked me, you in? For a moment, I considered politely declining, making some excuse about being busy this weekend, traipsing around a pretty much abandoned and possibly dangerous ship, one which it was common knowledge was often used by the homeless as a shelter during storms, was not exactly my idea of a fun time. But then, I caved. I knew Darren was only doing this as a way to keep his mind off his breakup, and if I left him alone with Zeke, without anyone to keep things from getting too out of hand, God only knew where things would end up. Sure, why not? I said. Immediately, both of my friends broke into soft cheers, slapping me on the shoulders and back. For a few more minutes, we discussed exactly how it'd go. Zeke's parents owned an old motorboat from the early 60s, and where their dock was just up the estuary from the cam, we'd use it, motoring down and tying up on the far side of the ship so we could climb aboard, quickly check it out, and leave. Later that night, I lay awake in bed, staring up at the white, popcorn-style ceiling of my bedroom. What in the exact hell did I just get myself into? I wondered. Shaking my head, I turned over on my side and drifted off into a rather restful and dreamless sleep. I had no idea it'd be one of the last good nights of sleep I would ever have. The next day, and a half passed by in a blur, 
Before I knew it, it was late Sunday afternoon. As much as I was, admittedly, a little tense about what we were about to do, I still wasn't going to back out. However, I did stop by Empire Mercantile to pick up a few items I wanted for the trip before heading to Zeke's parents' house. As I drove through the quickly emptying streets, I craned down to look out the windshield of my Lincoln at the setting sun. It looked almost blood red, sinking below the horizon. For some reason, it made me shiver slightly. I shook my head, speaking aloud as I pulled into the driveway. Get a grip, Adrian. Knock that superstitious BS off. There's nothing ominous about a red setting sun. Pushing the feeling away, I got out and passed around my purchases to the others. Each of us now had a pair of thick, tear-resistant, and waterproof gloves, and a small but powerful flashlight. What the heck are the gloves for? Zeke asked as we walked down the backyard to the dock. I raised an eyebrow at him. Have you seen how much rust is all over that ship? You want to cut yourself on a piece of rusty metal and risk getting tetanus or something. A look of realization passed over his face as my words registered. Oh was all he said, and then went silent. The three of us strode down the dock and climbed down into the 18-foot wooden boat, and a second later, the big, black and silver Mercury 1000 outboard roared to life. Here, Manzeke said, offering me the wheel. You're the best of the three of us at piloting a boat. I don't want to piss off my folks by hitting anything. I rolled my eyes slightly, but sat down in the seat, and after the stern, and bow lines had been cast off, nudged the throttle forward slightly. Flicking on the running lights, we pulled away from the dock and began our journey down to the can. Everyone was silent on the journey, though whether the silence was from excitement or apprehension, I couldn't tell. I gazed ahead of me, looking around as I allowed the 60-year-old motor to open up to full throttle. The last remnants of daylight were just barely visible over the edge of the dunes which separated the river from the Pacific Ocean. It honestly is a bit eerie out here. When everyone else has gone home for the night, I thought as we passed by the channel marker boy, all I could hear was the slap of the water against the boat's hull, the drone of the outboard, and occasionally a seagull cry overhead. I closed my eyes for a moment, inhaling the rather calming smell of the sea spray in the air, along with the mudflats, which had begun rising from the water with the arrival of low tide. A slight sense of peace was shattered by Darren's voice behind me. There, to port, my eyes snapped open and I glanced off to my left. He was right, I could clearly see the white paint standing out a good bit in the gathering darkness. Slowing the boat, I searched for someplace safe for us to tie up alongside her. Darren realized what I was looking for. Adrian, there, there's a boarding ladder on her side. Large. Obvious wooden steps set into the hull led up the starboard side of the ship from the waterline. I nodded. Nice catch, man I said, looking back to see a smile of accomplishment adorning his face. Slowing the boat even farther down, I swung it around and approached the ladder. Zeke climbed past me and over the windshield onto the bow area, picking up the curled bow line to help tie the boat up. I put the boat into neutral and let it coast the final few feet to the side. Careful, bro. I called out softly, as I saw my friend was preparing to step off the boat and onto the ladder. Don't worry, dude. I got this. He called back confidently and with a last, cocky smile, he hopped from the bow onto the ladder, causing a slight spike in anxiety to shoot through me. I watched him climb quickly up the ladder, reaching the railing and lifting himself over it. A moment later, I saw the bow line tighten, and his face appeared at the railing again. Stern line, Dar, he called. After a few attempts at throwing the line, with varying degrees of success, the boat was successfully tied up. I killed the engine as Darren climbed up the ladder, allowing the silence to overtake the estuary again. For a moment, I stood at the gunwale of the boat, my hand on the first wooden handhold, and wondered again what the hell we were getting ourselves into. A little too late to back out now, though. Sighing slightly, I tightened my gloved hands on the purchase and climbed up. A moment later, I hoisted myself over the rusty railing and finally was aboard, looking around at what I'd seen from my apartment window for years. I could immediately tell that the converted fairy and her glory days had once been both extremely beautiful and extremely luxurious. The wood below my feet, now weathered with time, must have cost a pretty penny to install when the ship had been built back in 1938, and it gave off an air of sophistication. 
Well, sophistication once, now ruin, I thought. Turning on my flashlight, I looked around to see where the other two had gotten off to. A flash of motion caught my eye from the stern section, and I thought I spied Zeke disappearing around a corner, where I knew from my walks down to the boat ramp lay the outside stairs, to the upper decks. Hurrying after, I rounded the corner, and felt a small wave of confusion wash over me. The stern deck was completely deserted, with no sign of life in sight. That's honestly freaking impossible. I know I saw somebody walk around the corner here. As I stared, debating whether to climb the steps or walk onto the port side of the lower walkway, a voice came from behind me, causing me to almost jump out of my skin. Adrian, I whirled around, my flashlight beam smacking right into the faces of my two friends. Zeke raised his hand to block the beam. Lower your light, you trying to blind us or something? He hissed. After a moment, I lowered it, looking intently at them. What? Darren finally asked. As the silence morphed into an uncomfortable one, did you two just dash around the entire outer section to get behind me or something? I asked. I saw the two exchange a look. Dude, what the hell are you talking about? Darren asked. I was about to answer when Zeke interrupted me. Ah, there's the stairs leading to the upper deck. He whispered, then, without waiting for either of us to respond, began climbing them. Come on, he called back down to us. After giving me a last look, Darren followed, still feeling perplexed at how sure I'd been in seeing someone round the corner and not wanting to be alone. I hurried up the creaking metal steps after them. The first door, which looked to lead to a once snazzy lounge area, was locked, and so we moved on. As we walked up to the starboard door to the bridge, I again looked around. The only sound I could now hear, which had started as I climbed the steps, was the humming and banging coming from the lumber mill across the estuary. I heard the scream of a saw filter across the water, in the dark, and on what I had to admit was already a slightly eerie vessel. I didn't like how it almost sounded like a woman screaming. Finally, we all stood in front of the door to the bridge. Darren looked at us. Well, here goes nothing, he said, then reached out and gripped the handle in one gloved hand. To our surprise, the door opened, and after an exchange of looks, the three of us slipped inside and closed the door. I shone the flashlight around. The ship never got an update in her equipment, that's for sure. The newest monitors, I could see looked to be at least from the mid to late 90s, if not earlier. Aside from them, what looked to be all her old gauges and levers remained, all covered in rust. A large, wooden helm sat close up to the front windows, which looked out onto the bow of the ship and the darkness beyond. Darren stepped forward and pressed a few buttons on one of the monitors. Well, the ship has no power turned on, he reported. Oh, really? I wouldn't have guessed that. Thanks for the heads up, sir states the obvious a lot. Zeke said sarcastically, hey, screw you, bro, I'm just trying to check things out. Darren hissed back, but I didn't hear what retort he received. My eyes were drawn to a rather large wooden table in the back corner of the bridge. Walking over to it, I saw in the flashlight's beam that old sailing charts littered the desktop, along with a red, closed book. Shooting a quick look around, I reached out and flipped it open, finding that it was the ship's lock. As I heard the other two move around, and to the door connecting the bridge to the upper lounge area, I read. Many of the more recent logs came from the very early 2000s. Most just seemed to detail her final voyage from South America up here to the Pacific Northwest. Simply mundane notes. However, one entry from late October of 2002 caught my eye. October 23, 2002. We've made it all the way from Panama, halfway up the California coast. The ship is running well, and the small handful of crew we've hired to bring her up to Portland tells me everything seems in working order. With luck, we'll reach Oregon by the first few weeks of November, barring one or two moorings to resupply and refuel. However, I must make mention of one thing. Manuel, the gentleman I purchased the cam from, told me to keep an eye and ear out for anything unusual. When he told me this, I was unsure of what he meant. Perhaps a broken prop mount or bearing he refused to repair in the engine. However, as I've spent a lot of time on my own in areas of this ship, as my wife, for some reason, refuses to venture to certain rooms, I've come to hear. Well, I probably am just hearing things. Ships, especially ones as old as the cam always creak and make strange noises. And yet, what in the hell kind of machine sounds like a person whispering or someone walking about where no one is? I'm unsure what to make of it. 
but decided to keep log of them in my private journal. Anyways, we should make it to home port safely. We'll log again soon. I raised an eyebrow, whispering, moving about. For a moment, the image of the person I swore I'd seen flashed through my mind. A small chill ran up my spine, and for a moment, it almost felt like I was being watched. But I shook it away. Adrian, there are no such things as ghosts or anything. Get a grip, dude I whispered. I looked up, seeing my friends had advanced into the upper lounge area and shining their lights on the hideously outdated furniture. Before I joined them, I decided to flip the page and quickly see what the next log read. However, as I flipped the page, I saw only a blank page. Inspecting closer, I saw small, torn edges of paper near the inner edge of the log. Huh, strange. Page's been torn out. For some reason, it gave me pause, but I shrugged it away and closed the logbook. Leaving it where it was, I moved from the bridge into the lounge. I'd been right in my initial assessment. Whoever had owned the ship last had gotten rid of what, today, would still look like beautiful and timeless furniture from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and instead replaced it with those god-awful designs, which had been the focal point of the 80s and 90s. I didn't want to keep looking at the tacky swirls and almost nauseating colors, and so I looked around, spying another staircase, this one leading down to the lower deck. Guys, come on, let's head down. I quickly checked my watch. The glow in the dark face showed it was just after 9 at night. We're only staying another 15 minutes or so, I told myself, then led the way down the steps. The lower level looked as though someone had retrofitted it into a dining room of some kind. It looked as though the previous owners had had the goal of turning the ship into a floating cruise ship slash restaurant, and looks like they went broke attempting to do so. Dude, this looks lame I heard Darren mutter behind me. I looked at him. I mean, we always heard all the creepy stories about the ship over the years. All the stories about the messed up things that happened aboard her since her early days. All the tales about the drugs, and experiments, and murders. And when we finally come aboard, what? We find out it was nothing more than some rich attempt to join the restaurant business. He kicked at a wooden booth. This blows. He suddenly yelled. This blows. It blows so much. And with that, he leaned against the booth, his body seeming to sag from some unseen weight. I could tell he'd been filling his head with the idea of exploring the ship for a while, using it as a mental block to not think about his girlfriend leaving him. And now that he was confronted with the reality, it was all starting to crash down around him. I stepped forward and put a hand on his shoulder. You know the stories we heard were far too good, or I should say bad, to be true, man. I said, that's how urban legends start. Someone takes something, blows it way out of proportion, and after a long game of telephone, it barely has any resemblance to the truth he looked up at me. His eyes, which earlier that night had been twinkling with excitement for the adventure, now simply seemed empty, slowly. He nodded, then sighed. Well, I think I'm about ready to get out of here. What about you? I let out a relieved sigh I hadn't known I'd been holding in. The truth was, as much as I knew it was just a ship, the whole abandoned angle, combined with the weird log entry had made me feel a little uneasy. Yeah, I'm ready as well. I turned. Seek, you're ready to leave. I called, but I received no answer. Seek, I repeated, my voice sounding, somehow echoing and muted at the same time as it bounced off the degrading wood and furniture. I still got no response. Darren let out a slightly annoyed snort of air, his realization having soured his mood more than a bit. Where the hell did he get off to? He grumbled, then raised his voice a little. Hey, Seek, get your ass out here or we're leaving you to swim home. I turned back to him. I hissed, even though I saw nobody through the windows on land, and it was likely our voices wouldn't be heard. I wasn't taking any chances, but still, our friend didn't answer. I began to feel the uneasy feeling return in spades. The interior of the ship almost seemed as if, like a light bulb being flicked on, to have instantly taken on a new atmosphere from the simply abandoned one it had held the entire time we'd been aboard. Now, with the lack of response from our friend, it had taken on an almost palpable sense of foreboding. I shone my flashlight around, looking for anywhere possible he could have gone to. Oh, you've gotta be kidding me, I heard Darren groan. What? I whispered back, and he pointed. Aiming the flashlight further into the room, I saw an open door, which led to a metal staircase going down. 
Over the doorway, a plaque read engine room and lower decks, employees only beyond this point. I let out a groan of my own. Of course he'd go down there for a moment. I debated shouting down the stairwell for Zeke to go screw himself, then shook my head. Like it or not, he was still my friend and I wouldn't leave him. Come on, let's go get him and get the hell out of here I said to Darren and led the way to the door. The steps, metal graded ones which had been painted a now fading white led steeply down into the darkness, and I took them slowly, knowing with their age, they could give way at any moment. After a few nervous seconds, we stepped off them into the bowels of the ship, shining my flashlight around. I saw the corridor it opened onto lead in two directions, one towards the bow of the ship, and another towards the stern, where the engine room had to be. My breathing came in slightly shallow. This area was giving off extremely eerie vibes. Darren sighed. Why does this feel like a scene from a horror movie where the lead characters are forced to split up? He asked quietly. I gave him a nervous look and chuckled. I wish you hadn't said that. I admitted, then reached into my coat pocket for the last two items I'd bought from the hardware store. Look, like it or not, if we want to get out of here quick, we're gonna have to each check out one area each to find Zeke. That doesn't mean I'm having us go unarmed, though. Here, take this I held out the medium sized object to my friend, who took it, flipping it open after a second to reveal a sharp, steel blade. He looked at it, then at me, what, you thought I was gonna be stupid enough to come aboard this thing unarmed, especially with the homeless people we see come aboard. He nodded, then suddenly looked hard at me, speaking of which, where exactly the hell are they? Shouldn't we have run into at least one of them by now, or some sign of their having been here? The question slammed into me like a truck. I hadn't thought about it, but he was right. The entire time aboard, we hadn't seen a blanket, wrappers, or anything that would signal homeless people had been on board recently. The realization made the unsettling feeling beginning to bubble up and my gut increase, and I shook my head. I pointed towards the stern. Look, let's just find Zeke and get out of here. You quickly go check the engine room, and I'm going to check the bow section, okay? We meet back here in five minutes, regardless. After a moment's hesitation, he nodded, then turned away and moved down the corridor. I took a deep breath, then turned and moved in the opposite direction. The corridor was tight and narrow, almost making me feel claustrophobic. My hand gripped the pocket knife tightly as my footsteps echoed off the metal grating. At the end of the corridor, I saw three or four doors. The first two were locked when I tried them, the handles only slightly jiggling. The third wouldn't even jiggle, it was jammed up tight. The final door opened, the hinges giving off a loud creak which echoed down the corridor, almost a little too loudly. I entered the room, shining my light around. I'd entered into some sort of cargo area. I could see crates stacked up against one wall, their wooden sides warped and rotted by moisture. Against a far wall was another desk, though this one much smaller and less grand than the one on the bridge and much older as well. It almost looked to be as old as the ship itself. I crossed to it, stopping as I thought I heard a creak behind me. Every muscle in my body tensed up, and my grip on my knife grew slightly sweaty. I took a deep breath, feeling again as though I were being watched, and finally spun around. No one was behind me. Everything, aside from me, was completely still, and all I could hear was the gentle lapping of waves against the hull outside. Giving a last, where he looked to the gloomy corners of the room, I turned back to the small desk. Immediately, I saw a few things which just seemed off to me. The first was that strange symbols appeared to have been carved into the desk, ones I had never seen before. Looking at them almost made my head feel dizzy, and so I focused away from them. The second thing which seemed to be off was a large chef's knife had been slammed into the wood. I reached out and attempted to pull it free, but it refused to budge, as if it had fused with the desk over the decades. The third were the only two other objects on the table. Two pieces of paper lay on the desk. The first looked extremely yellow with age, as if it were at least 60 or 70 years old. The second, to my surprise, looked like a page from the ship's logbook upstairs. I saw the tear marks along the left hand side of it. The torn out page, I shot another look around, knowing I should immediately get back to Darren. I didn't want to leave the guy alone in here, as much as I didn't want to be on my own any longer. And yet, something compelled me to lean down and pick up the two sheets of paper. I angled my flashlight down and began to read, first the torn out log, and then the yellowed page. 
As I read the log, I felt my pulse, which was already a little off, begin to rapidly speed up. My heart began to beat wildly in my chest, and I felt my mouth turn dry as cotton. Even though I never believed in any supernatural stuff, the words written on both pages filled me with an ever-increasing sense of horror and dread, the likes of which I'd never felt before. Oh, my God. I whispered as I finished the last sentence. That was when I heard it. It came from farther forward in the storage room, close to where the V of the bow met. I felt all the blood drain out of my face, and my eyes go wide, my breathing almost hitching in my chest. Every part of me wanted to scream at myself that I couldn't possibly be hearing what I was. Even now, I still can't help but tell myself that. And yet, I know what I heard. I heard a whisper. It was unintelligible, too soft and low to make out individual words, but it was, without a doubt, whispering. It sounded like the speaker was whispering extremely fast, under his breath. Dropping the papers, I slowly aimed my flashlight towards the bow, the beam shaking slightly in my grasp. For a moment, I couldn't understand what I was seeing. The beam almost seemed to reflect off and extremely, well, the only word I can use would be dense shadows, ones which the light couldn't chew away. And then the darkness began to spill out of its hidey hole, sliding towards me and engulfing everything it touched. Terror coursed through every fiber of my being. As I watched it slowly consume the crates, moving towards me, the sight of it beginning to creep over the papers, I dropped freed me from the trance-like state I'd fallen in, and I turned and bolted from the room, leaping over the metal divider the hatch had been set into. Darren, I screamed as I sprinted down the corridor, my voice, and footfalls smacking off the metal corridor like gunshots. Darren, we need to get the hell out of here. As I approached the door leading to the stairs, back up, I suddenly heard my friend scream from further down the corridor. Adrian, help me. I shot a glance back, seeing the almost living darkness begin to seep out of the room I'd come from. Making my decision, I sprinted down the corridor to the engine room. Darren, where are you? I screamed, and here, I'm trapped came his voice from just inside the hatch. I ducked my head and leapt through the hatch into the compartment. Huge, hulking diesel engine rose up on either side of me, but I didn't pay much attention to details. I saw Darren sitting on his ass in the middle of the room. His foot had fallen through the metal grating and he was attempting to free himself from the small hole it had caused. In seconds, I was by his side. I'll help you. I cried, then knelt down, beginning to pull at his leg. It gave leeway, slowly beginning to pull out. We need to get out of here, right now. I shouted as I saw his ankle emerge. Then I felt his leg go tense. I froze. It almost felt like all sound, and air had been sucked out of the engine room. The silence was unearthly and almost seemed to be filled with a sense of malice. Then I saw Darren lift his light and name it behind me. Zeke, he asked softly. Another huge shiver shot down my spine, and I slowly turned to look. Sure enough. Zeke stood at the other end of the engine room. He had his back to us, standing half in and half out of the shadows. I aimed my own light at him. As it passed over him, he almost seemed to wince at the light. Zeke, I called out after a moment. I was about to call again when the sound made me freeze up. And I know Darren heard it as well, because I saw his face go pale as mine must have. The whisper I'd heard was back, and it was not alone. I couldn't tell how many there were but it almost seemed like an entire group of people were rapidly whispering. Just like before, I couldn't tell what they were saying, but the sound made all the hair on my arms and legs stand up straight. And then, my heart almost stopped as I saw shadows step out of the gloom around our friend. And I don't mean people draped in shadow, I mean literal shadows, shaped into the rough outline of people stepped from the dark. I saw them poking their heads out from behind machinery, from crawl spaces a human couldn't possibly fit. From everywhere, there almost looked to be a dozen, or so figures standing there, just out of the range of our flashlight's beam. And now I could tell the whispering was coming from them. Keeping my eye on them, I reached down and began fumbling to free Darren's ankle again. I'd just about gotten it free when a new sound began, and this one did make my heart stop. Zeke had begun whispering himself. I couldn't tell what he was saying at first, as he was facing away, but it was almost in an identical manner. To the shadows, low and fast. I leaned forward slightly as I finally felt Darren's foot pull loose and to this day wished I hadn't because I finally understood what our friend was whispering. We'll never leave. 
the same three words. He kept repeating over and over, almost like a mantra, and I realized with a growing sense of horror that all the shadows were whispering the same words. I almost wanted to clap my hands over my ears to block out the almost maddening sound. What I can only assume is what the damned hear in hell. And then, it all stopped. Like someone had flicked off a television, the whispers, midway through their horrible mantra, ceased. The silence returned, a more horrific, deadly silence than I have ever heard. The shadows didn't melt away, they stayed, staring at us in the unearthly stillness. And then Zeke spoke clearly in a voice that, for some reason, sounded, just off. We'll never leave, he said quietly, and then turned to finally face us. I clapped a hand over my mouth to keep from screaming. My friend's normally bright green eyes were gone. In their place was just sheer blackness. It was as if a squid had squirted its ink into them, turning them completely black, irises, and all. Equally as horrible was the grin which was plastered over his face. It wasn't one I'd ever seen a human being give. If you've ever seen that crappy horror film from a few years ago, Truth or Dare, the smile the being possessing the main characters gave its victims. That was the smile he had on his face. And then he spoke, again with that voice that sounded wrong, as if it weren't just him speaking, but someone, or something else. And the four words he spoke did practically cause my heart to stop. And you'll never leave as the last word left his lips, the shadows, which had stayed where they were this entire time, began to move forward. Towards us, I shot a terrified look at Darren, who was stumbling to his feet. He had an identical look of horror on his face. We locked eyes as the shadows began to move towards us quicker, and then we were dashing out of the engine room. The whispering returned, almost deafeningly loud as we ran. It was joined by two more sounds, mine and Darren's screams. Behind us, I could feel the shadows pursuing us. They hadn't expected us to move so fast, and by the tone of the whispers, I could tell they were pissed about it. The two of us crashed into the stairwell, bolting up it. In the chaos, I dropped my flashlight and heard it bounce back down the stairs behind me. But I didn't stop to look, nor did I want to look back. Todd only knows what I might have seen if I had. We burst into the restaurant area, running for the closest door. For a moment, I was terrified that, like what happened before a character's death in a horror movie, the door would be jammed. But after a few terrified seconds fumbling with the lock, the door flew open, letting in the sea spray from outside. Forget the boat, just jump. I shouted at Darren, feeling the shadows still behind us. Almost as one, we took two running jumps. My right foot landed on top of the railing, and I pushed off. For a moment, the dark world swirled around me and then the freezing cold water enveloped me. For a few seconds, I feared I would drown in the darkness. Then, my head broke the surface. Sputtering out salt water, I immediately began swimming for the boat ramp, hearing the splashes of Darren beside me. After a few seconds, we reached the ramp, pulling ourselves onto the concrete and coughing. And after a minute, from Darren, sobbing. That horrific night was two weeks ago. Either one of us knew what we could possibly tell the police without seeming insane, and we couldn't explain what we were doing aboard without getting in trouble. And so, both of us just went home. Zeke's parents called the police to report their missing son a day, or so later. They found the boat, still tied up to the cam. They searched throughout the ship. I heard they found the flashlight. I dropped, the bulb broken, but they found no trace of Zeke. I knew they wouldn't. I feel consumed with guilt for my friend's disappearance. I had the chance to tell them no when they asked about sneaking aboard, and I didn't. No amount of booze can chase that fact away. I keep my kitchen blinds tightly shut now. I'm too terrified to look out of it. Too terrified I'll see those shadows staring at me from the windows of the cam, and I haven't had a decent night of sleep since. I keep having recurring nightmares. Horrible nightmares of those shadows coming for us. Nightmares of my friend or whatever he'd become, telling me in that horrible voice we'd never leave, before melting away to become a shadow himself. Nightmares of running down an endless maze of metal corridors, the whispering always following just behind me. But almost worse than that, I dream of those two papers I found in the storage room. A yellow paper telling in detail, which I don't dare describe, all the evil, depraved acts that the second to last owners did aboard her. Acts which dealt with the occult, dealing with human sacrifice, and more, with turning the ship itself into a sort of conduit. For what? I don't know. But from what I saw, a conduit or doorway for things which are insatiable, 
and Beyond Evil, and the final, brief log entry of the cam's previous owner, November 14, 2002. I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. I found that horrific paper wedged in the back of the old desk down below, talking about truly evil things, which Manuel and the others did on this ship over the decades since they bought it. All the death, occultism, and worse they performed, all in the name of creating some sort of doorway to somewhere else. The only word I can use to describe it is hell itself. I was afraid when the first member of my crew went missing that they simply fell overboard, drowned. But when more and more simply vanished, how could I have known? How could I have known what had been done when I bought this ship? Something I wanted to change our lives. For the better, my wife and I are the last two left. We hear the whispers filtering up from down below every day and night. They drive us to the brink of insanity. And worse, I've seen the shadows. The figures which watch us from every dark corner of the ship. My wife has not, and for that I'm thankful. I'm not even sure if we'll ever see shore again. I feel they have a similar fate in store for us as the rest of my crew. But we have a plan. We're aiming for the nearest port, and as soon as we dock, we're getting off. And I'm just letting the ship sit and rust away, no matter how much it costs, to moor. Let it sit and decay until it sinks. I'm not even sure if the evil witch lives in the hall will go then. But I don't know what else to do, and to anyone who may look over this lock, anyone from the Coast Guard, or anything, for that matter, if we don't make it back, and you find this while searching for us, please, for the love of God, heed my warning, get off this ship while you still can.